I'm not trying to raise kids. I'm trying to raise healthy adults. It's not about this moment. It's about a lifetime. My goal was not to get my kids to 18 and push them out of my house. My goal is to get to 18, 20, 40, and still have relationship with them. What's going on? This is Brad Snodgrass with another episode of the Iron Deep Podcast. And I have Nick Adams on the show with me today. What's going on, Nick? Hey, man. Going great. How about you? Yeah, man. Super excited uh, to interview you on this podcast. And uh, yeah, thanks for being on the show. And uh, guys, we're going to be definitely we're going to be talking about being a dad today. And it's funny how uh, this topic has came up just more and more and more lately. Uh, I think for my own life, I'm a dad. A lot of our listeners are dads. Uh, and this is one of the just kind of things that uh, men struggle with, actually, at the end of the day. Men struggle with just this, the father um, and, and being a dad. And I want to read just a little bit about Nick uh, before I kind of just jump into this, Nick. But Nick, uh, he's been a youth camp founder. He's a director. He's a pastor. He's been a business owner. He's been in the real estate world, commercial, commercial, residential, landlord. He's written his first book about being the dad you wish you had, The Five Big Stones for Effective Fatherhood. And he's writing books. Now he's a writer. He's a business owner, pastor. And, and now we're really just kind of be t- uh, talking about being a dad. And Nick, I'm going to tell you, I read your book and I think my first question is right off the bat because I know a lot of men struggle with being a dad, but here is something from your own childhood. You talked about being a memory of being in a hotel and you were concerned about your father finding you and killing you and your mother. So... That's not something that, 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 that is probably the most surprising thing. I mean, I've had, I've had challenging times with my dad, but can you tell us a little bit about this and your own childhood and relationship with your father? Sure. I mean, you know, it happened after church one night and um, my mom and I had gone to church. And when we came out of the church, my dad was, was there in the parking lot and he had a gun and he was very drunk. And he was going to kill my mom because he thought she was having an affair and she was going to kill me. And I'm not really sure how I was going to I I don't know what I had done. But anyway, it was it was the two of us. <laughs> and um, and so we got in the back of a car, laid down and I was laying in the floorboard and uh, folks from the church, you know, kind of drove us down back roads in Tennessee and and we escaped and uh, then hit out in the hotel that you're talking about there. For several days and just and then spent a couple of months hiding from my father uh just kind of out of fear and you know one of the reasons that that story is so important i think to the book is because in the book then i talk about all the things that i still learned from my father Mm -hmm. the positives and and we have a very difficult relationship uh you know i mean that was the difficult part. He mm. wasn't a difficult person. He was a pretty nice guy if he was sober. And, you know, most of the time it it wasn't exactly like that. Mm-hmm. But that was a definitely a scarring and uh, memorable moment. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that, that just kind of like grips, gripples, uh, grips your attention. And the other thing that just kind of grips again, just going back to your relationship with your own father, I was reading through and uh, I think between the ages of 11 and in your mid 40s that you never stay the night under one roof with your father uh, until that particular point. So you talk about just some of the different positives every of your relationship, but obviously some, some struggles. Can you go deeper in, into that, just your life from that pivotal moment, teenager into adulthood, never really being under the same roof with your father until another moment in life. But talk, talk to us about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's hard to know how much impact happens when you have that kind of a break in a relationship. And Um, from, like you said, from the time I was about 11 until I was in my forties, my father and I never stayed the night under the same roof. I would go see him on weekends. Um, I mean, after that first, you know, trying to, to kill us, there were months that I didn't see him. And then 
you know, that first reconnect was terrifying because I still wasn't sure what it was going to look like if he was going to hurt me or try to use me to get to mom, or I just didn't know what any of that would actually look like. So there's a whole lot of fear in that. Um, but then as, as we progressed through that relationship, we, you know, we, we got to the point that I would go see him every week, every other week and spend most of a Saturday with him and, and just hang out and we'd, we'd go fishing and he was a farmer. And so I'd help him at the farm. And, you know, I guess, relatively normal interaction. Mm -hmm. Um, but he had very little input into my life because I just saw him one day a week, you know, maybe two times a month, maybe three times a month. And, and of course on holidays, but not a deep connection for sure. Mm -hmm. And that really continued kind of on that pace. As I got older, I really disconnected a little bit more because life just gets busy. You go to college, you've got friends and you're dating and just all the stuff you do. And, and, and suddenly, you know, I might see dad once a month, mm -hmm. maybe just for Father's Day holidays, his birthday, just really that started backing off some. But after I got married and had grandkids, um, suddenly his interest changed, you know, and, and he, cause he never really came to, to my home until I had kids. Mm -hmm. And then he started showing up and he'd bring the kids gifts and he'd want to hang out with the girls and, you know, play with them. And, and, and that was really the beginning of a deeper reconnect, you know, is when I began to have children myself and then really just gradually over time, we were able to reconnect and to, um, you know, by the time that he was diagnosed with lung cancer, um, he came to live with my family and I, and that's the first time that he was back. We were back under the same roof. And, and then he lived with us for about three months until, um, uh, he eventually passed away. Well, wow. well, wow. can you talk about, and I know you, you know, you, to take him, him in, he's going through this, uh, very difficult time, um, obviously at the end of his life. And you talk about this deeper reconnect. What were some of the things and maybe the feelings that you had with, with your dad? I mean, did you go through anger? Like even when he was like wanting to spend time with your grandkids, uh, like, you know, why didn't you want to spend time with me? Um, uh, they say that time to kids, like time is love, right? If you are present, you can spend time. Did you go through some of that? Even were you aware of any of that in your teens or twenties? Like where you're like, you know, why, well, you know, maybe you saw someone else's dad and they had a decent relationship with their son. You're like, you know, why, you know, I don't have that with my dad. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I didn't have a whole lot of that. Okay. What I've realized as I've gotten older <laughs> is that I just stuffed all of that. You yeah. know, I stuffed all the emotions. I stuffed all the experience. And so I had a, a very difficult set of teen years, uh, very rebellious, lots of uh, acting out and just not, not a smooth sailing. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in my 20s, I, I really had a life changing encounter with Jesus that that made a difference for me going into the twenties. But then in my late twenties, um, I, this was a real moment for me. I was living in Nashville at the time and, um, and I was dealing with some depression and anger and just a lot of stuff and trying to kind of figure it out. And I was out one night walking my dog and just talking to God. And, and, and I'm just like, what in the world do something like you know, <laughs> help me. Mm -hmm. And, and, in that moment, it began, I began to realize part of what was missing was I lost my whole childhood. Mm. Like I, I didn't have a childhood and I, you know, even as a young child, mom and dad had issues. And when dad was in the home, he wasn't really present. He would be there, but he wasn't actually present. Um, and so in my late twenties, it hit me what all I had lost. Mm. I, I think I was acting out because of it all through my teens, you know, and then struggled some with those things in my, in my twenties, but I never had that. Oh gosh, I wish I had a better relationship with my dad. Oh gosh. I wish, you know, I could do things with him like other kids. I really didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But when I got to the, the kind of the end of my twenties, 
I had a real uh, shattering kind of moment where it's like, gosh, I got messed over. Mm -hmm. I didn't get what every kid deserves. Every kid deserves to live with their mom and dad Mm -hmm. and to have a home and to have a family and to that's what every kid deserves. And that got robbed. It got taken from me. And so that was a real, you know, moment for me. And, and it really took some time to process that reality and, and the emotions that I had hidden for so long. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it was the beginning of a healing process for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing your story. Um, I know it's uh, it was probably difficult just to, to strive through some of those experiences, but obviously healing. Um, we our audience is a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, guys that are leaders, hard chargers, and again, I think one of the things that I see men, even in this arena, is just the if they're passive anywhere, it's typically in their home, right as a husband or as a father that we can pursue very uh, hard certain things in our life, but then also be extremely passive in our own homes. You know, and you wrote this particular book, um, being the dad that you wish you had five stones. Let's just talk about effective, healthy, being a dad sometimes, you know, men that are listening to this may say, I, I have so much going on. It's just, it's so hard. Um, my mind's always turning. I can't slow down. I can't shut it off. I can't be present. Maybe take a stone. And I know you, you've been in that in your own life, right? So talk to us about, uh, this. Yeah. I think one of the things that it, it is the first stone of the book and, and it's that it's just the power of being. And, and I talk about how much influence dads have and how much power they have. And, and I really tie back into my experience with my father that, you know, as I've been describing here, it, we weren't like super, super close. And after a really hard break, <laughs> because after that, you know, obviously after he threatened to kill us, we never, you know, mom and dad divorced. And, but even with the disconnect that he and I had and the distance that we had, his life impacted mine. Mm. And when I look back over my life, I see characteristics in me that are there because of my father and, and good things. I mean, there's some bad things too, but mm-hmm. <laughs> let's focus on the good for a minute. Right. But um, I think that's one of the things, you know, for fathers that, Part of what I want to say in this book is you are having a huge impact, whether you're trying or not, whether you're doing well or not, you are impacting your kids mm. for better or worse. And I'm hoping to give dads hope that even if you're a train wreck, like I would say my father would not have won any fatherhood awards. And yet he left me some positive legacy. And so I, I want dads to have that sense of, wow, I may not be doing it all right, but I still have power in my kids' lives. I'm still having influence in my kids' lives. And then if I tweak that just a little bit, how much more influence could I have? I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have influence regardless. So if I just change it just a little, it's going to make such a difference. I mean, one of the things that I, I love to think about in relation to business is that Sometimes it's not these huge, big changes that take you from this level to that level. You know, there's really, it's a small something. It, it, it's it's 1% more. It's just a little bit more yeah. that'll push you on over that edge, you know, that, that will get the ball rolling for you. And I think fatherhood is like that. I, I, I We're not ever going to be perfect fathers. I'm certainly not a perfect father. Uh, if you find one, please send him to me. I'd like to interview him, (laughs) but, um, you know, we're not perfect dads, but if we just put a little more attention on it, it can become exponentially better. And I think that's a lot of what the book is about is being intentional. Yeah, no, definitely. I love what you talked about. Just the small changes, uh, just small, uh, pivots. And I was talking to, uh, a guy who mentors me a little bit. And I said, I'm really good at the big things. 
I'm really good at the big things. I can do the dad camps and, and uh, yeah. the daddy daughter camps, the dad son camps. I can take them camping, uh, coach their teams, whatever that looks like. I can do the big things, but I really struggle with the small things. I struggle with the day to day consistency of some of those small things. And, um, an example was my one son. He's, he's our middle child. And my wife told me the other day that he doesn't ever say he loves you to her back or he doesn't ever say he loves you. Like maybe he's, uh, um, she'll say, I love you all the time, but he never really responds, never really says it back. And I was kind of thinking about that and, and I wondered, and I, I tell him I, I love him, but same, but same thing. And, uh, so last night I really got, you know, on his level and, uh, you know, looked him, looked at him as my son and looked him in the eyes and said, I just want to let you know that you know, I re- I'm really proud of you and I'm, and I really, and I'm, I love you so much. And then he says it back, you know, but I think it's just those small things. Maybe it's just how we're doing that. It's just a small thing. We're saying the same things, but maybe it's how we say it, right? It's how we approach it at the same yeah. time, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. And it's not all about the response to, and maybe you can talk about that. Like, cause sometimes, you know, we, we expect a response. Oh, if I do this, then this will happen. Um, but sometimes the kids don't respond. Can you talk about that? Like in your own life and your own fatherhood, uh, of the struggling father that, you know, I'm trying to do these things, but my kids still are not responding. Yeah, I think that is a very interesting question because <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's just a part of it. And especially, I don't know. Well, I, that, that's not a really true statement. I was going to say, I think it might be worse with boys. I've got two boys and two girls. And, you know, I find the boys are a little more hesitant or unlikely to to respond with, you know, oh, I love you, or mm-hmm. the girls are a little, little more touchy feely. Right. But then I realized one of my daughters, like in the middle of her, like 11 to 13, like I couldn't have gotten a positive word out of her no matter what I did. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's just what's going to happen yes. because of, of where she was. And so I think part of that is, is on us. We just got to realize that we're the adults in the relationship, you know, we're the dads. Mm -hmm. And so we just keep giving the love. We Mm -hmm. keep giving the, the, you know, the positive reinforcement. We we're the ones who are there to support them. And, and at the end of the day, that really is the bottom line. My kids don't really owe me anything. Mm -hmm. I am responsible to rear them in a effective, godly manner so that they can be the people that God wants them to be. Mm -hmm. And they don't really owe me anything for that, you Mm -hmm. know? And so I think the more we can kind of come to that, that this is really, this is my job, you know, I'm the dad. And so I'm the one who's going to be giving. And if I get, if I get something back, man, that's great, you know? And, and I love that. I, when I was writing this book, I I told the story just recently, but when I was writing this book, uh, actually, I think the story's in the book. Um, in the middle of, of a night of writing, my son comes and I was sitting in a kind of an oversized chair in the living room and, and he was playing the game on, on his tablet or mm-hmm. something. And, and so he came and just sat in this chair with me, which there wasn't room for both of us. It, you know what I mean? Like it, it didn't work. <laughs> and I had to scoot way over and my laptop's kind of hanging off my lap and I'm trying to work and I've got notes and, you know, but he just wanted to be close. Yeah. And, and he didn't really even say anything. He just came and joined me in my space. And, yeah. you know, man, what a great feeling that was. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. There's a mixture between, and I think as dads, we want our kids to listen to us and to respect us. And it's funny, again, business owner, entrepreneur, I think this is why men gravitate towards their work, especially guys <laughs> that I struggle, that I, that I mentor, it's because they get respected. Like, you Absolutely. know, and if they don't get respected, <laughs> you're out. They're gone. <laughs> right. And then they That's don't right. and then they don't get respected at their at their home. So sometimes, you know, I want you to talk about how does a father kind of have that balance between right, having the fun, because I think, you know, we were even talking the other day, you were out, I think, playing in the snow with your kids. I was like, oh, you know, he's yeah. having having a lot of fun with his kids, but also mixed with wisdom and respect. Um what does that look like in your in your own family? Yeah. I think that is 
man, one of the, one of the chapters, one of actually one of the big stones is being lovable. And it's really what you're talking about. There's two or three chapters there about as dads, we're used to being kind of the bottom line and we're used to being authoritarian or, you know, disciplinarian or Mm -hmm. whatever kinds of, and like, man, like you point out, I think is so important. If you are the leader of an organization, you just get used to people doing what you ask them to do. Right. You, You know, and if it, if they don't, there's just, a problem. <laughs> this is not going to work <laughs> well. And and so then when you come home, it doesn't always look like that. Um, and so one of the things that I think is so important is to think about what are we looking for long term? You know, I'm not really trying to raise. I, somebody said this to me recently, and I love it. I'm not trying to raise kids. I'm trying to raise healthy adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so to keep your eye on what is it we're going for? I, mm-hmm. I, it's not about this moment; it's about a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so, when I'm interacting with my kids, one of the things I've got to try to do is remember that it's not just about today; it's about who are they going to be in ten years or fifteen years, and what do I want to put into their life, and how do I accomplish that? And and for me you know, it's, it's relationship. Mm -hmm. It's having long-term relationship. My goal was not to get my kids to 18 and push them out of my house. Mm -hmm. Um, My goal is to get to 18, 20, 40, and still have relationship with them Mm -hmm. to be, you know, connected. And one of the things that I really am loving right now is that one of my daughters is working with me uh, in in the writing and the promoting of my books and 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 helping run the camp. And, and it's like we're together every day, mm-hmm. you know, see each other all the time. And and there's relationship. Mm-hmm. And then my other daughter, my my daughters are my older kids. My mm-hmm. boys are still in middle school and then my daughters are both out of college. And uh, my other daughter says that I'm one of her best friends. Well, you know, that's what I wanted. I I want to have relationship with my kids. They don't have to work with me. They don't have to consider me their best friend, but I want to be in their life and I want to be their friend. And so in those moments every day, I have to think about how do I want to treat this child so that I don't break relationships, so that I capture their heart and and I keep their heart. And and we have long-term ongoing healthy relationship. And of course that, that changes. I, I talked about that in the book as well, that there's different stages and at each stage, my kids need something different from me. So I'm not trying to be my three-year-old's friend. Right. I, it's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I want to be my 20 year old's friend. Right. I want to be my three-year-old's disciplinarian, you yeah. know? Yeah. I, and so just those yeah. pieces. So when I come home, you know, that's the piece I'm looking for is how can I be lovable? How can I admit my faults? How can I admit when I make a mistake? How can I, you know, make sure they know how much I'm for them? And just Mm -hmm. those, those issues. No, I love that. I love that. It kind of goes back to the saying again, uh, um, you can't have correction if you don't have connection. That's one of the things, uh, Andy Stanley wrote a book, uh, parenting, getting it right. And he was obviously talking a lot about, just their relationship. And he even talked about uh, his, one of his goals was to have adult children that want to be with them when they don't have to be right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, in one chapter in your book, you talk about dad as a yardstick and you mentioned this concept of, of the father being a yarn, a yardstick for their children. Can you talk about this? Like, what does this, what does this exactly mean? Um, well, you know, I think our our kids are always looking to us to see who to be and how to be. And, you know, it's back to that reference I made about about my dad and the positives that I've learned from him, that just being with him, you know, he was a very generous man. My father was um, probably rarely moved above, uh, you know, kind of a, a baseline poverty level salary. Mm-hmm. Uh, never really had a lot of money. He was a mechanic or a machinist at a bowling alley. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just minimum wage, maybe slightly above for the majority of his life. Mm-hmm. And yet I watched him 
give in kind of extraordinary ways. I can remember being in the bowling alley with him and they were taking up a, a collection from, for somebody who had had a, I don't even really know what had happened, a death or a sickness or anyway, they were taking up a collection for somebody that was a, you know, regular at the bowling alley. And he pulled out an, and I would lie if I told you, I know what this is. Memory's terrible. Anyway, it's not very trustworthy, but it, in my mind, looking back on it, it was probably a hundred dollar bill because it was huge. And mm. it like, I can remember gasping inside and thinking, wow, like, Wow. Wow. And, and, and I knew then that he didn't have any money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like I, this were my teen years. And so, I mean, I knew that he was living kind of just very much on, on the bottom, but he was generous. And that is something that I try to model in my life that I try to take care of, of, of people around me. I try to give to folks who need, you know, try to be generous with, you know, all kinds of different ways. And so, that's come from my father. So he was a yardstick for me, something that I've kind of measured myself against. And then, you know, take that a step further is that we're setting, helping our family and especially our children to establish values, Mm -hmm. you know, what's important to them. And, you know, again, there's, there's a good grief. How many first, bunches and bunches of things that are valuable. Mm -hmm. And in each chapter of the book, I I give a little section that you can kind of do some reflection on. And and in the chapter about values, I list a whole bunch of values and kind of help guys walk through, you know, what's five or to seven values that I want to have in my life, because you can't value everything or you don't value anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, I can't pass on 40 values to my kids. Right. If I really work on passing on three or four, five or six, I may be able to do that. Mm. And so, you know, as a, as a yardstick, you're trying to say to your kids, here are the things that are important. Mm. And this, this is something that as a family, we really believe in. And, Mm. and, you know, my wife and I talked about that when the kids were really young, what are, what are important things to us? What are things that we want to pass on to our children? And, and how are we going to do that? Mm. Uh, We took, both of the girls on a missions trip when they were like four and six and we went and took gifts to orphanages and, you know, because what we wanted to pass on to them is we want to care about the world. We want to make a difference in people's lives. We want to take our faith globally, you know, and that was a value Mm -hmm. and we were very intentional and spent, you know, money Mm -hmm. (laughs) to make sure that those values were modeled to our, to our children. And so when, when we're talking about being a yardstick, that's a, part of it is, you know, helping them see the things that are important and giving them something to measure. Yeah, no, that's good. I I don't think you can start off too early with that. Uh, This is just something recently that, that my wife and we've been talking about is again, you know, take your last name, for example, like what are the Snodgrasses all about or what are the Adams all about? Um, And coming up with mantras and uh, yeah. So one of the things that my, my kids are, they range from 17 to five and then my two boys. So I got two girls and two boys too. My two girls are on the end. My two boys are eight and 10 in the middle. And uh, the one thing I've been talking about more and more is the snodgrasses are always better together. So, and that could, that could relate to if they're arguing about something, if they're not sharing for the little kids or, um, they don't want to play with, with somebody else. Right. You know, and, and I just, I don't have to discipline. I just say, you know what? The snodgrasses are always better together. So, That's awesome. so just things like that. I would just encourage you listener out there. I think what Nick's talking about too, is just like, you know, what is your family all about? What do you want to pass yeah. on? It doesn't have to be 40 things, but just, is there a couple, um, yeah. at the end of the day? So that's fun. Um, you talk in your book about just this reflection pool. And you refer to the dad as, as this reflection. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? And I think you obviously identity is a piece of that possibly, but talk to us about like the dad is this reflection pool of yeah. the children. I, I think in, in our culture, we're always being told who we are, you know, and we're getting all this feedback about what it means to be all kinds of things, a guy or a, an athlete or a, it doesn't, you know, whatever you want to say, there's always this reflection that's coming back to us from the culture around us. And so the point of that chapter is to say as dads, we have 
so much power and so much influence. And so if we'll take that and be a healthy reflection pool back to our children so that we can tell them what they, we can let them see what they really look like. Mm -hmm. We can let them see what the real value is. And, you know, one of the, the easiest examples of that is my oldest son, um, is like, he is a really intuitive, sensitive, um, social animal. Like he's just, he's really good. And mm -hmm. my youngest son has some, some disabilities, some learning disabilities. And, and my older son is always, you know, kind of looking out for him and trying to help him navigate life and really help us. I, I mean, I remember so distinctly, I had the two boys, I was taking them on a trip, just dad and the boys. And, um, and my younger son, he, if he doesn't, if everything isn't very regulated and consistent, mm -hmm. he really struggles. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of melting down and I was hungry and he was hungry and it was a bad, it was just bad. And yeah. so I'm like, if you, you got to stop, <laughs> you got to quiet, you know, yeah. like you just got to quit. <laughs> and, and I was getting more and more ramped up and, and just on the verge of, you know, being an yes. extremely unhealthy father. Right. And, and my son, who's like, I mean, he might have been six or seven, says to my younger son, hey, what's your favorite color? And so instead of like this thing I'm doing mm -hmm. of back and forth with him, he just distracts him, which yeah. was the absolute like, that's what a psychologist would have told you to do. I mean, it was just, yeah brilliant. You know, I'm like, uh, <laughs> like, like I, I have a master's and couldn't figure that out. And my seven year old's like, Oh, let's right. do this, you know, but, but he's, he's, he's just very intuitive. He's very people are in and he's, and he's sensitive. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, that being a 13 year old boy and being sensitive, isn't necessarily your, your leading trait, right. you know, it's not the yeah. one you, you know, it's not <laughs> the one you come out with first, you know, yeah. I'm a sensitive guy. <laughs> right. Um, so one of the things I try to do is just to reflect back to him how positive that is mm -hmm. and how, you know what, the fact that you're sensitive, you're going to have healthy relationships and you're going to be able to be a great husband and you're going to be able to have deep relationships with your friends. And because you're able to own your emotions and to, to really just to be a very real human. Mm -hmm. And, and that is awesome. And so I try to reflect the positive of that back to him so that when his friends are like, oh, wow, you're being sensitive or, you know, or, or whatever negative mm -hmm. thing comes out there, that he's got a little bit of reinforcement to go, OK, I mean, maybe I was being too sensitive in that moment, mm -hmm. but sensitivity isn't a bad thing, yeah. you know. And so with some perspective of years, hopefully as dads. We've we've lived long enough. We've seen enough in life that we have a little more perspective than our 13 year old son. And and we can just give him that perspective. You know, mm -hmm. of, of, here's what I see when when you do that or say that I want you to know what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and recently he, he told me this. He said, Dad, I've, I've got something I need to tell you. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, I could just tell the way he said it. It's like, this is going to be, I'm like, oh gosh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, I, I've needed to tell you for about six weeks. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and and then he, he launches into the story. But what I was able to say to him is because you're able to be honest, man, like that just makes me trust you all the more mm -hmm. because you're, and so I'm just reflecting back to him, the good things in his life and, and what they do for other people. No, I love that. I love that. Um, so such a great book. And, uh, we, we touched on a couple of the stones here and, uh, it's just, again, it's, it, I would encourage fathers, uh, dads to, to dig in being the dad that you wish you had. And as we wrap up the show here, uh, Nick, I want you to, sometimes I think for me, so my, again, I got different elements. My daughter's getting ready uh, to turn 17. So now it's starting to become pretty real. We're like, oh, wow. When did that come about? <laughs> I, I only have one year left. What do I want this year to look like with her, for example? But then there's young, young kids. And it's like, you know, men are in the trenches. Like I had a call the other day. Uh, one of my friends has five-year-old, three-year-old. And he was talking about, man, this is just really hard. They have some different challenges. Um, how, 
how would you just encourage the struggling fathers that are just kind of like in the trenches where they're like, they don't, they don't see the light right now. Right. They don't see, Oh, I got a year left. I got to get it together. I got They're like, wow, how long is this going to be chaotic in my home? (laughs) And and I just want that peace. Can you speak to them? Um, as a dad, as a, as a leader, speak to the struggling dads just in the trenches right now. Oh man. I think one of the first thoughts I had, as you were saying that is just the good news is it will pass. Mm. You know, I mean, things just change. And and I've had moments in my own life. Actually, I had one just recently because my, my mom has uh, broken her hip and I'm trying to take care of her. And I've got, you know, a special needs son and I've got it just businesses and all the stuff going on. And I mean, I, I about had a meltdown recently and, and it just, the reality that, I mean, in that moment, it seemed like there was not going to be a future, you know, and, and, and now I can't even really remember what's such a big deal. And that, we're just talking about three weeks ago. Right. And it's like, I don't, I mean, what was my problem? That's no big right. deal. And, and, and I know the, the thing that happens to us is sometimes they, they last way longer than that. Mm-hmm. And, and you are in those trenches. And, and I think just to know that, that nothing lasts forever, it's going to change. Things will level out, be different. Even if it's not better, it'll be different. Sometimes just the new challenge is better. Uh, But in the middle of that, gosh, be kind to yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, because again, a big thing that I want people to get out of this book is it's not being perfect. It's making progress. Mm -hmm. And so just be kind to yourself and just acknowledge, wow. And, and, and I love to, to acknowledge it to my kids. Wow. I, I really messed that up. Yeah. Wow. I wish I had done that differently. And that's not the end of the world, you know? And, and, and so as a dad, just to take a deep breath and go, okay, I may not be doing X, Y, and Z perfectly, but I am moving toward one of them. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm at least leaning into <laughs> X, you know, yes. uh, Y and Z aren't even on the radar yet, but I, I'm at least doing a little better here man, take that and go, because it isn't about being perfect. It's about making progress and, and, you know, kind of every day, just being kind to yourself and saying, wow, I'm making a difference in my kid's life because I'm showing up every day yeah. and maybe I'm not the perfect dad, but when I come home, I give him a hug, I give him a kiss. I look him in the eyes. Okay. That's, that's great, man. That is a big step down the road. And so I think, we can get so hung up. And one of the things I didn't want this book to be was another 20 things you need to do to be a good dad. Like right. really it's, I want to encourage you that you have power, you mm-hmm. have influence. And, mm-hmm. and it's every time you make a little change and make a little bit of progress, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Nick, thanks for, uh, thanks for being on the podcast today. This has been amazing. I appreciate you uh, so much. Make sure if you're listening in to go get being the dad that you wish you had, um, such an amazing book. Any, anything that you want to share if someone wants to reach out to you, I know you're doing, uh, like I said, you got youth camps, um, have, you're a writer, you're, uh, have this book, you're coming out with other books, uh, speaking, things of that nature. How can someone get a hold of you and, and look you up? Sure. Uh, one of the easiest ways is info at being dash dad.com. And so that, that comes to me. And so if people want information about the book or they just want to chat about something that's happening in their, you know, their family or whatever's going on, that's, that's a way to reach out. Awesome. Sounds good. We're going to put that in our show notes on our website and also on our YouTube channel. And I appreciate you, Nick, for being with us today. And that's a wrap. God bless you. I appreciate it very much, Brett. I've enjoyed being with you and your your whole group of folks, listeners. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time. 